Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to resource management, our first day of training uh, for Louisiana SFAs. My name is Denise Hignight. I am the resource management director at SAN Resource. So I have years of experience conducting USDA administrative reviews uh, in Louisiana as well as in other states. And today I am here to discuss financial management of the nonprofit school food service account. So today we'll be going over financial management, uh, specifically the financial management systems, financial reporting, financial documentation, and internal controls. I'll be doing another training on Thursday that will be discussing allowable costs and going into a lot of detail about the kind of costs that you can charge the nonprofit uh, school food service account. I touch on that briefly today, but if you have questions related to allowable costs, uh, just keep in mind that that training will be covered on Thursday. Okay. So today I am specifically focusing on the requirements that are outlined in the federal 2 CFR 200, which cover financial management requirements for all federal awards. So our focus again is going to be on financial management systems, financial reporting, financial documentation, and last but not least, internal controls. Okay. So 2 CFR 200-302 states that the financial management system of each non-federal entity must provide for the following. Identification in its accounts of all federal awards received and expended. Accurate, current, and complete disclosure of the financial results of each federal award. Records that identify financial obligations, unobligated balances, assets, expenditures, income and effective control over and accountability for all funds, property, and other assets. So if that doesn't make sense to you, we're gonna break it down. I'm gonna to explain to you what each of these means. Um, we're gonna go over some of the documentation that helps confirm that your financial management system is in compliance. Before we dig in too deep, I just wanna kind of go over some basic concepts, okay? This, this federal requirement is for all federal awards. It is not specific to the school food service program, but because the school food service program receives federal funding, uh, it is required to meet these requirements. Okay, so when the regulations talk about a non federal entity, we are referring to the school food authority, so the SFA. So we want to know about the SFA's financial management system. We're not interested in the food service management company's financial system, uh, financial management system. We're not interested in individual sites or schools. We want to know the SFA's financial management system. And again, if you're a food service director who keeps your own internal records, your own reports, those are very vital and important. But when it comes to the financial management system of your SFA, we, we need to look at the SFA as a whole. Okay. So we also understand that you don't have a lot of control as a food service director over the financial management system at your school. Okay. So your district has a financial management system and the best you can do is we're going to go over how can you make sure that the system that's been implemented by your school, by your district can be used effectively to track the nonprofit school food service account. Okay. And meet all these requirements. So financial management system, what are we even talking about? It is the software and processes used to manage income expenses and assets. I would colloquially refer this to as the books, so the accounting ledger. It can be a lot more than just the accounting system, but that's going to be our main focus today is talking about the accounting system. So software that is used to track um, your accounting system, that would be like Munis. If you're a small private school, um, you might be using QuickBooks. That's very commonly used accounting software. And then if you don't have software, uh, there's a chance you may not implement accounting software, although it's become pretty common these days, you may just have processes in place in which to manage income expenses and assets. This is usually done in the form of a cash book, a checking account register, um, and you're using what we call a single entry accounting. So I wanted to mention that just simply because accounting software is not a requirement. It's just a common uh, financial management system. Okay. So we're focusing in on general accounting and financial close. Okay, so these are concepts uh, involving general ledger, accounts receivable, accounts payable, payroll, financial reports and statements, inventory, fixed assets. Hopefully some of these terms are familiar to you as a food service director. You may, you're not the one who's um, recording these in your accounting system, but you do need to be aware of these concepts to make sure that the food service program is being accounted for correctly. 
in your financial management system. So when we're talking about financial close, we are referring to the process of verifying and adjusting account balances at the end of an accounting cycle. So at the end of a quarter, at the end of a year to produce financial reports. So many of you guys are aware of this during a USDA administrative review. If you are reviewed um, at the beginning of a school year, your school district may still be going through the financial close process. So you may not have final numbers for um, all your revenues and your expenses, your closing balance, and that's okay. But as a food service director, you need to be aware of the financial close process um, so you can understand which numbers are unaudited and which ones are not finalized yet, okay? So um, accounting cycle, this could be like quarterly budget reports. It could be your annual financial report that's uh, submitted to the state. And specifically to us, the CNP income and expense report, which has to be submitted to the Department of Education Child Nutrition Program. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the specifics for the school food service program. So the regulation we had just discussed applies to all federal awards, but the NSLP regulations give us some more details about what's required specifically for an SFA that operates a USDA child nutrition program like the National School Lunch Program. So 7 CFR 21014 tells us that a SFA shall maintain a nonprofit school food service. Revenues received by the nonprofit school food service are to be used only for the operation or improvement of such food service. So what we're discussing here is revenues and then how those revenues are spent. Okay, and that makes up what we call the nonprofit school food service. The definition of the nonprofit school food service account is the restricted account in which all revenue from all food service operations conducted by the SFA principally for the benefit of the school children is retained and used only for the operation or improvement of the nonprofit school food service. So your financial management system needs to be able to facilitate this requirement, okay? And then um, this just emphasizes, this is a state agency requirement that SF they have to monitor their SFAs to make sure that the SFAs are complying with the requirement to account for all revenues and expenditures. And this is where we get the DOE CNP income and expense report because it is a state agency requirement to make sure that SFAs are reporting the financial results of the program to make sure that you are tracking revenues and expenditures separately for the program. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what are the financial management system requirements for the school food service program? This is kind of just a rehash of the regulations we just cited. You have to maintain a separate nonprofit school food service account. You need to be tracking revenues and expenditures separately. There's a requirement to maintain a restricted account. So what we mean by restricted is that your financial management system must be able to restrict the funds for food service to ensure those funds aren't used for unauthorized purposes, okay? What exactly that looks like in your financial management system, we'll talk about that later when we get into the different types of financial management systems. Um, but just keep in mind that there's this requirement to restrict funds to food service, okay? So it's not just about the revenues and expenditures, it's at the end of the day, how much money is left in the food service account and is that being restricted to food service use, okay? Um, operations must principally benefit the school children. That usually applies, okay? However, occasionally we do run into SFAs that are um, participating in other food service operations. Maybe you're a nonprofit organization um, that serves adult clients as well as students. So you need to keep in mind that if you are operating other food services, that they need to be kept separate from your nonprofit school food service. And again, all program revenues must be used only for allowable program costs. So again, we go into details about allowable costs on Thursday, um, but just keep in mind that you have your system must be able to track how you're spending the funds and making sure that those costs are identified as allowable. So how would you determine that you have a separate nonprofit school food service account? Like what kind of reports 
Do you need to be able to provide during an administrative review? What type of reports should you be getting routinely <clears throat> to make sure that your business office is um, appropriately accounting for the school food service program? Okay, the big one comes back down to a detailed transaction or general ledger report. Okay, there's different names for this, but the idea is that we need a report that shows all transactions for school food service operations, okay, all revenues, all expenses, all assets, liabilities, and equity, if that applies to your program, okay? Um, if you are a large SFA, this might be a huge document, okay? And so by itself, it may not be incredibly useful for you to get a 600-page detailed general ledger report, in which case you are <clears throat> going to most likely want to use um, more consolidated reports, like a statement of revenues and expenditures or a budget analysis report of some kind. However, if requested to submit a detailed general ledger report, your system needs to be able to provide that for food service. Okay, so if me as an auditor, if I want to look through 600 pages of transactions, you know, that may be what I have to end up doing during an administrative review. Okay, but this information does need to be made available. We do need to be able to see all transactions that occurred within the nonprofit school food service account. <clears throat> uh, the transaction details in the report, we're looking for dates, vendor names, amounts, line descriptions and memos, invoice numbers. Uh, one I didn't mention here is um, account codes. So if I'm given an Excel document that doesn't have accounting codes, then my first thought is going to be it wasn't run from your financial management system. It might have been run, you might have manually compiled it in Excel. And we want to see that you have a financial management system, right? And where um, your accounting software, what codes are being used to track food service. So if you cannot um, provide a complete, accurate, detailed general ledger report or detailed transaction report, you likely don't have an adequate, adequately separate nonprofit school food service account, and you may need to make some changes. <clears throat> So what we're not looking for during an administrative review or what's not proof of a separate food service account by itself. So these can be very useful reports and we may need to look at them in addition to a detailed ledger report, but they're not proof by themselves that you maintain a separate nonprofit school food service account would be like a vendor paid list. So again, very useful, but it only shows you um, the payments that are made to vendors. So it's not gonna include payroll, it might not include any adjusting journal entries that are made at the business office level to reclass expenses or to move funds between funds. Um, and it won't show revenues either. So a vendor pay list can be useful, but it's not necessarily proof of a separate nonprofit school food service account. Bank statements in a cash transaction report, again, very useful because this is the cash flow. So we wanna see the cash that's going in and out of the nonprofit school food service account but it doesn't necessarily capture all transactions. Some transactions are non-cash um, and sometimes an SFA won't use their bank account solely for food service or vice versa. Maybe food services, some transactions are happening in the general operating account instead of the food service bank account. So this can be a good piece of the food service account, but um, we're concerned about the ledger. We wanna know the financial management system, not necessarily what's going in and out of the bank account, but how that's being recorded in the accounting ledger. A statement of revenues and expenditures. So this is a good report. We often start off an administrative review requesting a statement of revenues and expenditures. As a food service director, you should be receiving a statement of revenues and expenditures every year because this includes critical information that you will then need to report on the DOE income and expense report. But by itself, it doesn't necessarily give us everything we need, okay? Hopefully, if you have a statement of revenues and expenditures, you can then run a detailed report showing what makes up all those revenues and expenses. Um, but by itself, if this is just basically a summary report, and we do need to be able to uh, support a report like this with source documentation from the ledger, okay? And then a manual compilation of a spreadsheet showing deposits and payments you might be keeping track, especially if you're a smaller SFA, um, you may be able to keep track on your own within the food service department, your own purchases and um, keeping track of the USDA reimbursements, the claims, that kind of thing. 
that's again, all very good, useful information, but we care most about how is it getting tracked in your financial management system? So is your accountant able to capture those transactions correctly and keep track of those within the food service account? Okay, so you can use your manually compiled statements to reconcile to what the books show to make sure that, you know, the numbers come out to what you're expecting. Um, but it's not necessarily proof during an administrative review that you have a separate nonprofit school food service account. Uh, if you're audited every year, there is a statement of federal award expenditures, and it does identify the expenses that were spent on the federal award. This by itself, again, is not proof that you have a separate food service account. It's a good sign because it means the auditor was able to identify uh, food service expenditures, but uh, we would still need to have that supported using the detailed transaction or general ledger report. Okay, so before we get any further, I want to just discuss briefly the concept of methods of accounting because there's going to be different methods of accounting. Uh, your SFA uh, may use any one of these, possibly multiple methods of accounting. And it's important to understand uh, what method is being used by your SFA because it will affect um, cutoff issues and it will affect when revenues and expenses are recorded. Okay, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So cash basis of accounting, this is the simplest form of accounting, okay? It follows cash transactions. When cash is received, the revenue is recorded. So you have a debit to cash, a credit to revenue. Okay, very straightforward. When cash is paid, then the expense is recorded. You have a credit to cash and a debit to expenses. What the cash basis of accounting does not do is it doesn't capture non-cash transactions. So if you use accounts payable, if you have accounts receivable, equipment's not necessarily gonna be re uh, recorded. It, it's gonna be recorded when the cash is paid. You're not gonna have um, equipment on a balance sheet. So there's some weaknesses to a cash basis of accounting. Many SFAs will keep their books on the cash basis of accounting, but then they will present financial statements using a different method, and that's allowable. So it would be helpful for you to understand when you are given financial reports from your business office, what method of accounting is being used, okay? And it's possible it, it's the cash basis, okay? Um, modified accrual basis of accounting is going to be the most common at the governmental fund level. So if you're a public school district with a food service fund, then um, most likely, well, your financial reports on your district audit report will be presented on a modified accrual basis of accounting, okay? And there's a good chance that your accounting ledger is being trued up to the modified accrual basis at the end of the year. Those are those um, like audit adjustments that you would see in the ledger once an audit's been complete. Okay, so the modified accrual basis, it's a government method of accounting. So if you're a private school and you're not uh, a government entity, then you probably don't use the modified accrual basis of accounting. The main concept here is that there's no long-term assets and liabilities. So if you have pension liabilities or um, like equipment would be a long-term asset, you will not see those on the balance sheet. Okay, they're expensed when they're incurred or they don't appear on the food service fund statements at all. Um, and then the accrual basis of accounting is our third method of accounting. Uh, this is the basis that is used for government wide statements. So this is an excerpt from a district audit report that just I, states that the government wide statement of net position and statement of activities are presented using the accrual basis of accounting. Okay. So revenues are recorded when earned, not received, and expenses are recorded when incurred, not paid. So the concept here would be like the easiest example would be a June claim for reimbursement. Okay. If it wasn't actually paid until July under the mod under the accrual basis of accounting or the modified accrual basis of accounting, that June claim will still be recorded within that school year. So if it was June, 2022, the revenue would be recorded within school year 21-22 because the revenues were earned, the meals were served during school year 21-22. But if you're on a cash basis of accounting, you're not going to record that June claim for reimbursement as revenue until you get the cash. So until uh, July or August, in which case your June claim is now getting recorded in your financial management system in the next school year. 
Okay. And that's okay. You just have to be aware that that's happening because you're going to run into issues where you are trying to report financial data to the state. And maybe the state notices that your total revenues don't match the claim system. You need to be able to understand why. Okay. And it's because your June, you're recording on a cash basis. And so your June claim wasn't actually recorded in your system until the following school year. Okay. So just being aware of those different methods of accounting will help you understand um, how to report financial data to the state and will help you be able to explain differences between totals from the claim system versus, say, uh, your financial management system. Okay, so um, here is a transaction report that lists out food service expenses. This was a very small SFA. They only had one food service expense code, and it was uh, just, they called it school cafeteria, and it was where they recorded their food service management company invoices. One thing I noticed was at the bottom of the report, it says that it was an accrual basis. So you can see at the very bottom, if your screen is big enough, it does say accrual basis. This is a QuickBooks report, I think. Um, but it turns out that they were not using the accrual basis of accounting. So I only bring this up because I want you to be aware that if you're given a financial report that says the basis of accounting on there, it may not be correct because the system may not be set up correctly or it's possible it was set up correctly. It's just not being used as an accrual basis of accounting. I knew that this was an accrual basis of accounting because the split column, so where when they recorded the expense, the um, there always has to be a debit and a credit. So the opposite to the expense was to a checking account. And normally, if you're under an accrual basis of accounting, you would be uh, recording accounts payable. And then I also noticed that the May expense, the very last line, wasn't actually recorded until July. And under the accrual basis, it would have been recorded in May. Okay. So just be aware that just because the report says an accrual basis doesn't mean it actually is the accrual basis. So which method of accounting does your SFA use? You need to ask, probably. Okay, You need to ask your accountant. You need to ask your business office to figure out uh, the reports that you are given, what basis of accounting is being used. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of financial management systems for maintaining a separate nonprofit school food service account. Okay, uh, The first one is fund accounting, and this is what the government regulations are kind of written around. If you are a public school district, you are using fund accounting and therefore your financial management system does meet all these requirements. Now, whether or not you're using that system correctly um, and you know there might still be some compliance issues, but the system has been set up to function in a way that will meet all the federal requirements, okay? So fund accounting is a independent fiscal and accounting entity with a self-balancing set of accounts. So fund accounting segregates funds according to their intended purpose. So food service is gonna be com kept completely separate from other funds, okay? So um, the emphasis is on accountability, not profitability, which is why this is a government accounting concept because we're not looking for profit, we're looking for accountability, right? Are you using taxpayer dollars wisely for the program? However, if you are not a public school district, sometimes nonprofits will use fund accounting, but most of the time, fund accounting does not work if you're not a government entity, okay? So an SFA is not required to adopt fund accounting in order to run the National School Lunch Program. So there are other alternatives to meet this requirement to maintain a separate nonprofit school food service account without completely overhauling your financial management system and adopting fund accounting. Okay. So the next simplest option would be maintaining a cafeteria bank account. So a cafeteria bank account, if it's used to track all food service cash transactions, then a cafeteria bank account could basically function as a food service bucket or a fund, okay? So it's physically keeping the food service cash separate, which would meet that restricted requirement for uh, maintaining a restricted account for the nonprofit school food service program. What a cafeteria bank account can't do is track non-cash transactions. So kind of what I was mentioning before with the um, cash basis of accounting, any assets or liabilities such as accounts receivable, accounts payable, 
those are going to be tracked with the cafeteria bank account because the bank account is only tracking the cash flow. And the other warning with a bank account is if not all transactions go through the cafeteria bank account, then the bank account's no longer an accurate measure of the food service balance, right? So you would have to keep track of any money that's owed between bank accounts and that gets very complicated. So if you were using your cafeteria bank account solely for food service operations uh, and all transactions go through this bank account, then it can function basically as a separate food service fund, okay? And in the financial management system, there will be a cash asset line for the cafeteria bank account and that will be the balance for food service, okay? So that is possible. You just need to be aware um, that any transactions that happen outside that bank account, you need to be careful about how that is being recorded and whether that is being captured within the nonprofit school food service chart of accounts, okay? When I say go through the food service bank account, this can mean repayments as well. So if payroll is paid out of a general operating account, food service can repay the operating account for the payroll routinely. And then that payroll will have ended up being recorded within the cafeteria bank account. The big thing with bank accounts is they need to be reconciled to the accounting ledger. So if uh, you're relying on your cafeteria bank account to maintain a separate nonprofit school food service account, I mean, it should apply to anyone who has a, a bank account. Bank, bank accounts must be reconciled routinely, but it's incredibly important for you as a food service director to make sure that your cafeteria bank accounts are being reconciled. You sh it should be done on a monthly basis and you should be able to get a reconciliation report. And it basically just shows you the, um, the cash transactions and then any transactions that are outstanding. So if you've written a check, if they've written a check, but it hasn't been cashed yet, it will show up as an outstanding item. If you notice on the reconciliation report that there are outstanding items that have been there for a long time, then those need to get resolved, right? Maybe the check got lost and it's never going to be cashed. You don't want it to be sitting there on your books unpaid for so long, okay? So bank reconciliation reports are incredibly important. So food service fund, cafeteria bank account, if you don't have either of those, because it's not always possible to establish a cafeteria bank account, there are limits to financial transactions, uh, caps to the amount of money that can move in and out daily, and that may not work for the size of your SFA. You may be kind of put under this other category where, okay, you don't have fund accounting, you don't have a separate bank account, what do you do? So this is where we can run into more frequent issues with whether or not you're actually maintaining a nonprofit school food service account. It's absolutely possible to be in compliance. You just have to be more careful, okay? So the most common system is that food service is commingled within a general operating account. So cash is commingled. Cash is not physically separated. Other assets and liabilities and equity are usually not physically separated, but revenues and expenses are separately recorded. This is a requirement. You have to be able to track revenues and expenses separately. Okay. And then at the end of the year, if your program operates at a deficit every year, expenses exceed revenues, then there is no cash. There are no assets that you have to keep track of from year to year. Okay. The opening and closing balance would be zero. I caution you though, because a lot of SFAs think they operate at a deficit. And then during an administrative review, you know, maybe a source of funding was left out on accident, some revenues weren't being tracked correctly. And it turns out the program has been operating at a surplus. And then that begs the question well, how are they tracking the accumulation of food service funds? At the end of the year, when there is money left over, how are they making sure that that money is being set aside and restricted for food service? Okay. Um, the simplest way to do that would be a like uh, manual report. Basically you prepare financial reports every year, it shows the opening balance plus revenues minus expenses equal the ending balance. I will show something later that explains that a little further. Um, but the point is that if you're in this position, you need to decide how are you going to track the accumulation of food service funds? At the end of the year, if there's money left over, how is that money getting tracked as the opening balance of the next year's, uh, uh, next year's balance? Okay, so let's take a look at some documentation that helps support a separate nonprofit school food service. Chart of accounts, this is a big one. A chart of accounts identifies all accounting codes used for food service transactions. Okay, so we're talking revenues. It's usually organized by source, so federal, state, and local. 
Uh, and then depending on the size of your SFA, you may have like site codes or program codes that you might be using to break up revenues further. Just identify, like for example, local adult meal sales. You, your accountant might be recording uh, adult meal sales by site. So you can see which, if your high school or your elementary school, which one um, had the adult meal payments. Okay. Expenses are usually broken up by object code, function code, site code, or program code. This is going to depend on your chart of accounts. And then it also includes balance sheet code, so asset, liability, and equity. If you don't use fund accounting, then you may not have asset, liability, and equity accounts for food service. But again, at the bare minimum, you have to be able to provide a chart of accounts showing revenues and expenses that those codes are discrete for the food service program. Okay, so here's like an example from a public school's um, financial management policies, and it just broke down like the chart of accounts. It kind of explained the different revenue codes, the expenditures, how the object codes work. And basically the idea is it's a long accounting string, right? The first couple numbers represent the fund. The next couple numbers represent the revenue or the expense or the balance sheet um, account code. And then you've got like the object code or the function code, and then maybe you've got the site code, and then you've got the program code. So this can be a really long string of numbers that will make sense to an accountant and may not make sense to you. But the point is that you should be able to get a chart of accounts from your business office that show you what accounting codes are being used to track food service transactions, okay? Um, this is a very simple example, okay? 10 is the food service fund. In this state, they actually use fund 40 for capital expenditures, which is why the very last one is 40. Um, and then all of the, the next code, it would, the ones that start with five, those are all the revenues. And then the ones that start with two are all the expenses. Okay, so there are no assets and liabilities uh, in this example, because in this state, they actually did not use a separate fund for food service, okay? But if you have a separate fund, there would also be numbers listed out for assets, liability, and equity. Okay, But you can see the breakdown of the different categories of revenue and the different categories of expenses. So when they provide me a statement of revenues and expenses or a detailed transaction report, it should include all of these codes. Right? These are the codes that are being used to capture food service transactions. Keep in mind that um, chart of accounts need to change if there are changes to the program. So if you start receiving like emergency funding because of COVID, you need to make sure that there is a place in your financial management system to record those revenues for the food service program. Okay, let's talk about USDA reimbursements. So there is a requirement to make sure that you are tracking all USDA reimbursements received by the program. Hopefully that's fairly obvious because this is going to be your primary funding source, right? So we want to make sure that the claims that you are um, uh, submitting and receiving payment for are being recorded and captured in your financial management system, okay? So you need to make sure that those reimbursements are being recorded to food service revenue codes, okay? Make sure that you're not combining USDA reimbursements with any other federal funds like ESSER funds. We do want to see that food service uh, federal funding is being separated within the accounting ledger, okay, to food service revenue codes. And we did see this a couple times this year where um, basically all payments that were received from the federal government were kind of lumped together under one uh, revenue code. And we do want to see that food service is being separately identified, okay? We recommend using line descriptions uh, to ensure that each transaction matches the month's claim. So for example, uh, February 22, NSLP, okay? And that you're routinely recording accrual to actual adjustments. So this may not, this may not make sense to you if, you if you don't quite understand the concept of accruing, um, but sometimes before you've received the claim, your accountant will record it in the ledger uh, as your estimated amount of money that you're expected to receive. And then when the funding actually comes in, if there's any difference between those numbers, they should be adjusting it to make sure revenue matches your claim. So the point is that your re revenues, your USDA reimbursements in your financial management system need to reconcile to the claim system, okay? This is something we do during a USDA administrative review. It's one of the first things we do is we look at federal revenues. Does that match the claim system? Or if it doesn't match, is it easy to figure out like what the difference is? For example, a June claim that was not received until July, okay? But what we're encouraging everyone to do is 
do this on your end. As a food service director, you should be getting a revenue report and then you should be looking at the claim system and making sure that those numbers tie out. And if they don't, can your business office explain that to you? Like, why don't those numbers match? And this is your chance to catch and fix any misclassifications, typos. The most common one is just a simple accounting error. They accidentally recorded it to a different revenue code. Hopefully those are caught at the very end of the year, okay? But don't wait that long to find out, okay? Especially if you're getting a USDA administrative review because we might catch it before your auditors do, okay? So we're trying to encourage implementing these routine reconciliations just to make sure that you know what is happening in your financial management system for the school lunch program, okay? Um, so this is just an example. You can see all the revenues listed out for this SFA. I thought at first this looked great because they had the line descriptions. You can see July 21, August 21, September 21, October 21, all the way through for the whole year. Every month is represented. The issue is when I pulled up the claim system, none of these numbers matched the claims. The total didn't match either. And it turned out they were accruing these estimated reimbursements, but then they never trued up revenue to the actual reimbursements received. Okay. Um, and so again, just make sure that the total federal revenues match your claim system, okay, or it's reconcilable to it. And this ended up being a review finding because they were not accruing program revenue correctly to their financial management system. Okay, program expenses. So the, the gist of program expenses is that the ledger needs to support your program expenses, okay? So you shouldn't have to export a ledger report to Excel and then make manual adjustments to that Excel workbook to show uh, food service expenses, right? All food service expenses need to be captured in a food service expense code within your financial management system, okay? So this includes any allocated costs or any shared costs that you need to allocate out to food service. That should be done within your financial management system, okay? So here's a very simple example of an expense report We've got um, all program expense, expenses recorded to food service expense codes. You can see that they've got all the um, expense lines have numbers next to them. The 6,000 ones are for uh, payroll, 6030s for groceries, 6046 is non food, 6050 is workman's comp. So we are seeing here that they have a chart of accounts because they have discrete expense accounts set up for food service. Um, and that they have different expense categories set up, right? They've got payroll separated from food, which is separated from supplies, okay? So this all look, you know, looked good from a statement of expenditures perspective, and then they should be able to provide detailed ledger reports to show us what makes up these totals, okay? So again, we've got the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. This again needs to be supported by the ledger. You need to make sure that actual program expenses don't exceed what your um, federal expenditures statement shows on your audit report. So this, I, you don't need to worry about this too much. Just understand that there is a statement. It's called the Schedule of Expenditures of Federal Awards on your annual audit. And there's a section for the child nutrition cluster, okay? And this is going to show the expenditures for the food service program, but it won't, ex it'll include commodities, your national school lunch program and special milk program, student breakfast program. The total is not going to exceed USDA reimbursements received for the year, and it's not going to exceed program expenses, or at least it shouldn't, okay? Okay, reporting requirements. So we've got the DOE income and expense report. Your financial management system needs to be able to provide you the data to fill out the DOE income and expense report. And if it doesn't, then you need to adjust your financial management system make to figure out what data is missing, okay? So you need to know your prior year opening balance. You need to know your revenues, your expenses, and then DOE also wants you to uh, report your net cash resources. So this is basically your closing fund balance. Um, for more, most SFAs, it'll be the same. The only thing that's missing from net cash resources would be inventory. You take inventory out. So here's the screenshot of the DOE income and expense report. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Again, this first section is all the income and reimbursements. So you need to be able to report revenues. Then we have all of our expense categories that you need to be able to fill out. And then you've got the last section on net cash resources. Okay. So your financial management system must provide for the accurate, current, and complete disclosure of financial results of the nonprofit school food service account. Accurate means that it's free of misstatement. 
that you have found and corrected any mistakes before you report this data to, um, uh, to the state agency and that you've reconciled these reports to other systems. So again, reimbursements are reconciled to your claim system. Point of sale reports can support your revenues, your local sales revenue. Uh, current means that it's recent and timely, okay? So the more outdated a financial report is, the less useful it becomes, okay? So you wanna keep in mind that financial reports need to be uh, provided on a, timely, on a timely basis. Complete means that it includes all transactions for the reporting period. So you haven't accidentally left off some revenues or expenses. So what's the purpose of financial reporting? Financial transparency is the big one. So the nonprofit school food service account funded by the taxpayers through the USDA child nutrition program. So you are accountable to the taxpayer, okay? And then the other big purpose is decision-making, right? So financial results should drive decision-making, okay? Budget reports should be based on recent historical data and then any forecasting that you do for the upcoming year. So financial reports are incredibly important to running a, um, a smart program, okay? Common issues I see, staff. So this is mostly business staff because you as a food service director shouldn't have access to the financial management system. Um, so a lot of times staff may not be trained on how to run some common financial reports. So they may need some additional training. Inconsistent reports. So during an administrative review, I'm provided with three different sets of reports, a profit and loss, a detailed ledger report, and then I have the DOE income and expense report. And somehow all of those reports show different revenue and expense totals, okay? And there's often a reason for it, sometimes even a reasonable explanation, but you need to be careful about submitting inconsistent reports because that does raise red flags during an administrative review. It looks like you don't really know how your program performed, right? What were the actual accurate, current and complete financial results of your program? If I have three different reports that tell me three different things, then you know what's which one's the right answer, okay? Balance sheet doesn't balance. I got a surprisingly large number of balance sheets this year that didn't balance, okay? So that is a huge red flag for an accountant who is looking at a balance sheet and it turns out you know, it's not a balanced balance sheet. If you don't know what that means, I'll explain it in just a second, um, but your accountant should know what that means. So making sure that they don't provide you a balance sheet that's that's unbalanced. It means there's accounting errors, okay? So either someone compiled the report wrong or there's mistakes in your financial management system, okay? And then unclear responsibility. Who's responsible for financial reporting? It's the school board and the SFA management. So as a food service director, you should be partially responsible for helping compile some of this data, but you don't have access to the financial management system or you shouldn't. Okay, so you are relying on financial reports that are being provided from someone else, and those are the people that are responsible for the financial management of the program. So the school board and the SFA management, not the food service director, not the food service management company, not a consultant, okay, it is SFA management's responsibility. So some tips, keep in mind consistency. If the reports aren't consistent, then they're not useful, okay, so making sure expenses are being reported the same way every year. Written procedures, just write down everything you do at the end of the year, because in 12 months when you do it again, you'll probably have forgotten exactly what you did to, um, to correctly provide the financial reporting data to the state. Okay, so write down the name of the reports, the parameters, when to run the reports. This also helps during employee turnover. Timeliness, don't wait until the end of the year to make adjusting entries. So your accountant shouldn't be waiting until June 30th or later to make uh, to reclass expenses into the food service account. These should be happening throughout the year, okay? Uh, obviously there is a balance between workload with timeliness. Sometimes it, there are some reclasses that require um, a lot of work. And so those may get pushed off into the end of the year. That's okay, that's understandable. But most food service expenses and revenues need to be reported on a timely basis, recorded on a timely basis. So some tips. Have a checklist for financial close, annual processes, any adjusting entries that need to be made, general fund transfers, a schedule for your external audit so you know when that happens. Don't wait for the auditor to catch mistakes. As a food service director, look at your financial reports and see if you can find any mistakes before the auditor finds them. Be aware of any significant reporting issues at the SFA level. So we look at your district audit reports, the last three of them during the USDA administrative review. If there were any serious issues that came up, even if they weren't related to food service, such as fraud 
or significant financial misstatements, we may consider that a risk flag for food service because the same financial staff that's responsible for tracking food service is also responsible for preparing these other uh, financial reports. So just keep in mind that uh, any big issues at the SFA level may trickle down to food service, okay? So ultimately, what are we looking for? We need to, you need to make sure that you can provide the opening balance plus the revenues minus the expenses equals the closing balance. And then that closing balance becomes the opening balance for the next year, okay? On an audit report for like this example here, there's a child nutrition column on their fund statements. This is what this does. At the bottom, there's a beginning fund balance. Then they've got all their revenues, all their expenses, and that equals their ending fund balance. Okay, so even if you're not audited every year and you don't have an auditor doing this for you, you still need to be able to provide this information because these are the financial results of the program. A common reports would be statements of revenues and expenses, profit and loss report, statement of activities. Those are all basically the same thing, to be honest. There's some technical differences, but for you guys, any of these reports would help provide most of this information. And then on the other side, we've got our assets and liabilities and equity. This is a balance sheet or a statement of financial position. And this is what I meant by a balanced balance sheet. So assets must equal liabilities plus equity. If they don't, then something's wrong, okay? The simplest version of this would be if your only asset is cash, then that is your equity, okay? You don't have any accounts payable. You don't have any accounts receivable. There's no equipment, nothing else. Cash equals your financial position, which is your equity, okay? So just making sure that if you're given a balance sheet that your assets equal the liabilities plus equity, okay? So there's other financial reports that you may use as a food service director. We may not look at them closely during an administrative review, but budget reports are incredibly important, okay? You can run into issues if budgets are exceeded. You're probably already more familiar with some of the budget issues than I am, just because that is something that probably comes up in your day-to-day -day financial management of the program, okay? So budget to actual analysis. And then just remember that just because something was budgeted does not mean that it actually occurred in the accounting ledger. So we did see that quite a bit. I see this across all different states. Food service directors will tell me, oh, there was a general fund transfer into the food service fund. And I look at the financial state, the financial statements. I look at the financial reports that we were given. And I see that there was a budgeted fund transfer that never actually occurred. Okay. Often this is because food service ended up um, operating at a surplus and they weren't expected to. So the school board doesn't actually authorize a fund transfer like it was originally budgeted. Okay. So just keeping in, in mind when you're looking at financial reports, just because they told you that there was going to be a fund transfer does not mean it actually happened. You need to be able to have the financial reports that support a fund transfer being moved into the food service fund, okay? And usually there's columns on a financial report that will say budget and actual. You care about the actual, okay? Or that's what we care about. We want to know what actually happened in the food service account. Okay, source documentation, we got vendor invoices, delivery receipts, purchase orders, vendor contracts, payroll summaries, timesheets, employee agreements, personal activity reports, time studies, stipend agreements, this can go on forever. This is all kind of documentation that supports the transactions that were report that are recorded in your financial management system. Mileage reimbursement forms, travel vouchers, employee refund forms, training agendas. This is all documentation we may end up asking for during an administrative review, and it supports the revenues and expenses um, that, again, are recorded in your financial management system. Allocation spreadsheets, square footage documentation, utility usage studies, indirect cost rate agreements, indirect cost rate calculations, deposit slips, point of sale reports, cash receipts, looking at the LDOE claim system, bank statements. Okay, so these are all source documentation. You need to be aware of financial obligations, okay? So you, the SFA's financial management system is required to maintain records that identify financial obligations of the school food service account. So here's an example of a balance sheet that shows a very large, over $2 million is due to the general fund, okay? That's a lot of money. So as a food service director, you need to know how did that balance originate and how will it be resolved? Like, how is your program going to pay that back to the general fund? This may be okay, right? There, there may be a reason for this. Maybe food service uh, paid for payroll. Maybe food service operated at a deficit for um, for a couple of years, and now they're expecting to start turning a surplus again, and so they're expecting to be able to repay the food service uh, to repay the general fund. 
But the issue is if there's a growing interfund liability, and we will look for this during an administrative review, we'll look back at your balance sheets for the last five, 10 years. And if we see that this due to general fund is just getting bigger every single year, we're going to have questions for you. Like, how are you planning on repaying this? Are you planning on repaying this? Um, and keep in mind a documented loan agreement is a requirement. Okay, so for a small amount of funds that are owed between the general fund and the food service fund, those are normal. Okay, so payroll um, is a common one. But once this becomes a large liability, then there needs to be some sort of documented loan agreement between the food service department and the school board agreeing on how these funds will be repaid. Okay, so food service assets must be identifiable, right? So if you do, if you use fund accounting, no problem. You have balance sheet that shows food service assets. If you have a bank account, no problem. You've got cash, which is the primary asset. If you have neither, you need to be tracking the accumulation of, of funds, so assets. So um, there's ways of doing this, establishing a manual system where you know what the opening balance is, plus revenues minus expenses equal the closing balance. So I just want you to keep in mind that you do need a way of tracking the assets for food service. Safeguarding assets is another requirement. And we're not just talking about cash, we're talking about fixed assets. So equipment, making sure that you have accountability over your fixed assets. We may ask for a fixed asset list showing all equipment um, for the food service program. Meal balances, accounts receivable. Okay, so these are um, unpaid meal balances that students and their parent uh, uh, families owe the program. Okay, so that is, that is an asset to the program. Other funds like USDA match of MFP funds, emergency funding, equipment grants, that's all funding that belongs to the food service account. So you have to make sure you're safeguarding um, those revenues. Local sales as well, adult meal sales, student meal payments, they must accrue to the food service account. So you need to make sure that those are being recorded as revenues to the food service program and that you're keeping track of those. So if you have any questions on the financial management system, financial reporting, financial documentation, go ahead and drop them in the chat. And if I don't get to the questions today, then I will um, send a follow-up like Q&A. <coughs> I have about 10 minutes to go over internal controls. So I'm going to kind of rush through internal controls a bit. Um, and then at the end, if you have questions about internal controls as well, you can add that to any questions. So it's just like a little comic lighten things up for internal controls this can be a dull subject okay so i'm gonna try to make it as interesting as i can but um internal controls covers just about anything okay and so we're going to try to focus it in on food service and what can you be doing as a food service director to make sure that you have internal controls in place to protect your program uh but a lot of times internal controls go back to the SFA level. So your district has internal controls. Are you implementing those inter internal controls within the food service department? Okay. So the federal regulations require that an SFA uh, has written procedures for determining the allowability of costs in accordance with allowable cost regulations and the conditions of the federal award. So we're gonna talk about allowable costs on Thursday, but the big thing here is that you need to have an allowable cost policy and procedures. So written procedures for allowable costs, they should be integrated with your existing financial management policies and procedures. So you can add sections that are specific to food service within your district policies. Um, they need to identify purchase requests, approval and recording and record keeping processes. And you should address what we're gonna discuss on Thursday, which is the subpart E requirements. All costs must be reasonable, necessary, allocable and adequately documented. Okay. Any interfund transfers, those would uh, potentially fall under unallowable cost issues. And so making sure that you have processes in place if they're moving funds in and out of the food service fund, uh, financial reports, bank reconciliations, all that fun stuff. Okay, so internal controls, an SFA must, this is a long wall of text, but establish and maintain effective internal control that provides reasonable assurance that the SFA is managing the program in compliance with federal statutes, regulations, and the terms and conditions of the federal award. And then they tell you that you should be following um, some government accounting uh, or government resources on internal controls or uh, COSO, which we'll talk about in a second. So again, non-federal entity, we're talking about the school food authority, again, not the food service management company. 
not the consultant, not an external auditor. These are internal controls. It is what it, are you doing within your school food authority to make sure that your program is in compliance. You cannot pass internal controls off to a, a consultant, okay? They can help you with it and help you develop internal controls, but your internal controls need to be internal, okay? Okay, you're also required to comply with US Constitution, federal statutes, regulations, terms and conditions of the federal awards, evaluate and monitor compliance, take prompt action when non-compliance is found, and take reasonable measures to safeguard what we call protected, uh, personally identifiable information. Okay, so establishing and maintaining internal controls Again, this captures anything. So basically, if there's a compliance issue in your program, it can come back to internal controls. So you're out of control or out of compliance. What could you have done differently to prevent, detect, and correct areas of non-compliance? That question should drive your internal control policies, even within your food service department. So when there is, are non-compliance issues, what do you need to do to uh, establish stronger internal controls? So here's just a brief explanation of the GAO Green Book. This is what was referenced, uh, what you should be basing your internal controls on. There's a bunch of different principles related to a control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, monitoring. If you've been through, um, if you've been through any sort of business program, they've probably talked about internal controls. Okay. COSO is very similar. They took the same principles, but then they added, like, they made it a cube to make it look fancier, right? So we've got operations, reporting, and compliance on top. Okay. All this does, these are just concepts that help drive internal controls. Okay. So evaluating and monitoring, you need to be proactive. Are your established internal controls working? Are they up to date? A lot of times I see internal control policies that have not been updated for years, or I notice that they're not following the procedures that they've, that they've provided me during a review. So if you're not following your own internal controls, that may get noticed during a review, okay? Example would be monitoring net cash resource compliance. Don't wait until the state tells you that you're out of compliance with net cash resources. You should be doing monthly or quarterly financial reviews, right? And you should have written procedures on how to calculate it, if you're out of compliance, what do you need to do? Okay, so responding to non-compliance, this issue is to do with repeat findings, right? You, if you have repeat findings in your administrative review, then um, you need to improve your internal controls. Document your corrective action and your follow-up responses. Uh, if there's any district findings, make sure that uh, the food service director, that you've been made aware of those. Okay. And then the privacy and confidentiality one, that has to do with safeguarding protected personally identifiable information. So limiting access to IT systems, physical records, and knowing how to redact sensitive information. So during an administrative review, I do not want your social security numbers of all of your employees on the payroll reports, right? So if there's a way to redact that information, please do it because I don't want that sensitive data in our files, okay? It's not something I need. So just being aware of that sensitive information, making sure that only allowable people have access to the information and that when you run reports, you know how to redact sensitive information. Okay. Um, I don't think we have time to go over all the principles to complete, to be completely honest. So I'm just going to hit the, like the major ones. So control environment. Do you have a commitment to integrity and ethical values? Okay. Code of conduct. Do you exercise oversight responsibility? Okay. Is there a whistleblower submission process? So if someone suspects fraud, do you have a process for reporting fraud to the district level? Okay. Is there an established structure, responsibility, authority, segregation of duties, commitment to competence? Okay, so this is training. Enforcing accountability when someone does something wrong, are they corrected for it? Is action taken or do employees know they can get away with wrongdoing? Okay, risk assessment principles. The concept here is that you have identified risks in your program, okay? So this can be done at the food service level. What are risks, okay? So this example here is cash receipts, right? There is a risk, you handle cash in the cafeteria, there is a risk that cash is going to be misplaced. There's a risk that cash isn't going to be deposited and recorded correctly. There's a lot of risks that are associated with cash handling, okay? So what are the mitigation strategies that you can implement to make sure that cash is handled correctly, okay? Assessing the risk for fraud, Everybody likes to think it would never happen to them, but I have reviewed several SFAs this year that are undergoing fraud investigations. Okay, so it does happen. 
Um, making sure that you can identify, analyze, and respond to change, right? So don't leave these stagnant. They need to be updated. Control activity principles. So we're talking about responding to the risk that you just identified. So if you think there's a risk of miscoding, of inappropriate cost transfers, budget overages, segregation of duty issues, what are you doing to respond to those risks? Okay. Um, so like here would be, so in this case, they identified a risk and then they had key controls. Okay, so that, that was the responses. These are the controls that are being implemented to mitigate the risk. Okay. When segregation of duties is not practicable. So a lot of times if you're a small SFA, you may not be able to establish segregation of duties. What have you done to develop alternative control activities? Okay, so there are things that you can do to put into your processes that help mitigate the risk of um, lack of segregation of duties. Uh, your information system. So this is your financial management system, making sure that it actually functions the way it needs to function and that it is serving your needs. Okay, so there are controls in place. Using quality information, right? So your financial management system does capture accurate and timely information. Source documentation exists. You have a way of tracking all of those receipts and invoices and the mileage reimbursements and all of that, that it is being stored in a way that uh, that it can be recalled during a review, okay? Communication internally. So making sure that there's a good chain of um, communication between your business office and the food service department and communicating externally. So being able to communicate with your vendors, your state agency, with the contractors. Performing monitoring activities. This is management's job as a food service director. Any controls that you put into place to make sure that your employees know what they need to be doing to stay in compliance, are you monitoring those to make sure that they're actually happening? And even above you is the is a, the superintendent or is someone at the district level monitoring you to make sure that you're implementing the controls that you need to be uh, in order to run an effective program. Okay, so any issues are identified. There's a bunch of different categories of internal controls. Mostly I like to focus on the documentation. So written policies and procedures, financial management procedures. These are like accounting handbooks, segregation of duties, safeguarding assets, accountability, and competency and training. Okay, so if you're able to provide examples of that fall under these categories, then you'll be able to meet the require, show that you're meeting the requirement to have internal controls in place. Okay, I have a bunch of examples here. I think, I believe the, um, this PowerPoint presentation will be available online. And so I, I think it would be more beneficial if you're interested to know what internal controls look like to go through these last few slides so you can actually kind of see. I gave uh, snapshots. It's not a, I mean, a lot of these documents are long, so I could only take little screenshots of them to show what, what, they're, what they are. But written policy and procedures, we're looking at district policies that cover purchasing, uh, fixed assets, grant accounting. Unallowable costs. This is just a little snip from a district policy that discusses unallowable costs and uh, how that applies to federal grants. Okay. There's uh, often a list of allowable and unallowable costs that can be very helpful. And it, what I loved about this one is it identified um, what's allowable under state funding, what's allowable or not under federal funding, and what's allowable or not under local funding. So something that can't be coded to a federal grant might be covered under local funds. So if you want to purchase something for your program that's unallowable, your district may be able to purchase it using the general fund. They just can't use the food service fund. Okay, so there's kind of that concept laid out here in this kind of policy. A guide to internal controls and risk management. The school district was able to provide a fantastic example of internal controls, risk management. They identified a bunch of risks. They uh, implemented controls for those risks. This was for the district, but there were specific controls in here for food service. Okay, so again, these are district level that have been integrated, you know, food service has been integrated into the district level controls. Um, this narrative just kind of explained their processes for things It identified some basic segregation of duties. So responsibilities are across multiple employees. Uh, you have organizational charts, flow charts, and then are individuals who initiate transactions different than those approving the transactions and those recording the transactions? Um, identifying 
mitigation of segregation of duties. So again, if segregation of duties is not practical, have you developed alternative control processes? This example kind of provided some basic uh, mitigation strategies. Accountability. Is it clear who's responsible for the financial management of the program? So here there was an internal control memo that provided that came from the director of finance who basically stated like it's his job as a director of finance to set the ethical tone for the SFA. Okay, so little things like that just give clues to the internal control environment within an SFA. So is management committed to openness, honesty, integrity, and ethical behavior? Is child nutrition supported by the tone at the top? So we understand that as a food service director, you don't have a lot of control of the tone at the top, right? You may or may not be supported by your uh, district management. So where you're not supported, you can attempt, you can create internal controls within your department that help protect the food service program, okay? Um, but it is important to be aware of that tone of the top. And even as a food service director, you are management. And so making sure that your staff are aware that you are um, committed to openness, honesty, integrity, and ethical behavior. Okay. Accountability, again, oversight and accountability of the financial management. Who's in charge of financial management? You know, as a food ser service director, you are, but then also the school board is responsible. So just for identifying those responsible parties. In this example, it was a grant accountant who was given the responsibility of maintaining, of tracking the, uh, the food service program. Uh, financial management procedures. What we're looking for here is like authorization, right? So if you have a process for approving purchases, we want to see that. We want signatures on purchase invoices. We want delivery receipts that have been signed, okay? You can't just say that you have a system and then no documentation for it, okay? So making sure that you are documenting signatures, dates, authorization stamps, paid invoices, all of that documentation is clear in your source documentation. Um, journal entries, transferring costs. I, I just bring this up a lot because I feel like a lot of times food service directors aren't aware of what's happening at the district level in the books. So again, if money is being moved to and from the food service account as a food service director, you need to be aware of that. Okay. And hopefully you're at the very least involved in the communication, if not directly involved in the approval of any fund transfers in or out of food service. Bank reconciliations, vital. If you have a bank uh, bank account for food service, you need to be getting bank reconciliations from your business department. And uh, one of the like little things that I think is important is that the bank statements should be received and opened by someone who doesn't have access to the general ledger. Okay, so in this case, it was an accounts payable clerk, so they're like limited to just accounts payable within the system, and so. Uh, making sure, and the reason for that is just uh, to detect fraud, right? So like someone who can't affect what is happening in the financial management system is looking through the bank statement to identify any questionable costs, okay? So this could be a secretary also um, who reviews the bank statements if they don't have access to the financial management system. Safeguarding assets, simplest thing, security cash boxes, right? Where's the cash being stored? to make sure that it is safe, okay? So that is absolutely something you need to know as a food service director. Um, competency, competency and training. So this was an example of a child nutrition program that required their employees to go through cash handling um, training, and then they had to sign a copy of the manual and a statement of understanding. And this was part of their policies and procedures. They were able to also provide the signed copies of the training. So this was a good internal control. And that's it. That <laughs> did pretty quick, but um, that kind of covered a really like quick version of internal controls. There's a lot of different types of internal controls. The important part is just making sure that you have documentation in place to show what are your policies, what are your procedures, are you following those procedures? Is anyone monitoring the procedures to make sure that those are actually happening? Okay. So if you have questions about like what you need to do to implement stronger internal controls. You can drop those in the chat and I will follow up with additional information as needed. So I hope you guys learned something. Again, if you have questions, please let me know. And I hope to see all of you guys on Thursday. If you have a business manager, or business staff that you think should be involved in this kind of training, please make sure you forward the invitation to them. I think that this training is obviously geared towards financial staff. And so 
you know, it could be very helpful. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys so much. I hope you learned something.